Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library.
thank you, Stuart, and also thanks to uh, the continued collaboration between uh, our community and uh, fabulous uh, cultural stars, the uh, Stonyton Free Library and Magruder Centre. Uh, long may it continue. Now, uh, <coughs> Harry Martin is not a, an ordinary man by any means. He's complex. Uh, but there are several basic things that you should know about him, uh, quite apart from his illustrious career. First, he's a passionate man. And that explains a lot behind his Irish drive, for which he credits his grandfather, <coughs> Dominic, who left Galway in 1890 at age 30. He brings passion to absolutely everything, even little things that he does. Now, though Harry generates uh, his passion himself, he has another uh, hidden weapon, and that is his wife, Susan, <laughs> who helps moderate that passion <laughs> and helps him moder <coughs> achieve his objectives that might not otherwise have been achieved. The biography of my father is a perfect example uh, with Harry's passion uh, for the story and it's Susan's moderating influence. Harry was able to pull off an excellent biography of my father uh, out of his magical hat. Harry says he owes a lot to the success from his grandfather, but it, it's really Harry's own steam shovel energy and passion that has gotten through uh, not only uh, private secondary school, uh, Harvard College and law school, a career in a prestigious uh, uh, Wall Street law firm, then trans transitioning to diplomacy in Latin America, and later climbing the corporate ladder on <clears throat> banking worlds and becoming a CEO of Merrill uh, Lynch Bank in London, and later an Arab bank consortium in New York. Um, this, uh, and then since then, he also provided uh, financial uh, and planning advice to America's uh, largest uh, private families. Harry has been an avid reader, and you know his excitement for characters has come from his reading and his historical studies. And I think you know we're lucky. I'm I'm lucky enough to have had uh, Harry become excited by my father. And as a consequence, he's sat down, came to me, and we've written a story. And so this is really all over to Harry. I should say that uh, he make the presentation. Uh, there may be questions for both of us afterward, and we welcome your questions at that point. Thank you. This fellow inveigled himself into my wife's consciousness so that when we had a few disputes over text and don't think that doesn't happen, my dear wife, whom he alludes to, used to say, don't you dare send a nasty message to that dear man. <laughs> so what happened was I was forbidden to ever send an email to Cormac without Susan's edit. Okay? So here I am, much moderated and toned down. Okay, now it's very important in a complex story like this to understand that we are dealing with a warring period and our character has two aspects of his life. The first one is as a renowned combat leader. The second one is as a renowned intellectual writer of two great books who married a tumultuous woman. But in the first part of his life, we are restricted to the warring period in Ireland from 1916 to 1924. There were three conflicts in that period. The first one was the Easter Rising of 1916 in Dublin, where Irishmen rose up against England for their freedom at a time when England was fighting Germany. Uh, this was treasonous to the English who brought an enormous force in and crushed the revolution. But the revolution or the rising in Dublin, even though only 500 people were lost, half of them civilians, led directly to the War of Independence. So first we have, from 1916 to 1924, the Easter Rising in Dublin. Then we have the War of Independence, which goes from 1919 to 1921, and that's where Ernie became a general. 
Irishmen from all over the country fighting the Brits, who had as many as 60,000 troops at the end of that war in Ireland, many more than they had in India, a country 30 or 40 times larger. Then the last little battle in Ireland was the Civil War. When I say little, these events were very important for world history in Ireland. They didn't have many casualties. About 2,500 people were killed in the War of Independence and about 2,500 in the Civil War. The Civil War is little known and it came about because the majority of Ireland thought that it was time to end the war against Britain and accept a treaty. And I'm going to be describing that. Now the reason I went to this effort in the beginning is that the provisional IRA from 1970 tonight to the present, who blew up Montbatten's boat with his family on it, who blew up Harrods at Sheridan in London, who did all these terrible things, is a very different IRA from the early IRA that fought for Britain's freedom. And the early IRA resulted in the 26 southern counties becoming free. The six northern counties are still alive with Britain, and there are Catholics and Protestants in them. The Catholics are subjugated pretty much and discriminated against. And the provisional IRA that all of you know in your lives are from that period. We are not talking about that period this evening. OK, now let's go to Ernie. These, Every time somebody introduces you, they take some of your stuff. So everybody knows about Dominic Martin. He came from Galway in, 19, uh, in 1890. Now, for some reason, as a boy, my grandfather had a great impression on me. And he had seven children, and there were five boys, including my father, and two girls. And every time he went to Grandpa's house, even though several of his sons were remarkably successful, I knew that the sons were all still afraid of him. And he sat in a chair in the kitchen with a black shillelagh beside it. And when he heard that my father was sending me to Andover, he was very upset. He said, Mikey, come over here. He said, Irish immigrant families like us, we don't send our children to schools like that. That's for the English on the hill. And I want to give you some advice to take you through life. Come over here. And he would grip your knees. And what he said was, number one, nothing's good enough for your friends, but nothing's bad enough for your enemies. That's the fighting Irish, OK? I said, what's number two, Grandpa? And he said, never let any man ride over ye. And these were the two messages I got as a 16-year-old that took me through life. OK, Susan and I retired to this wonderful community. And here is this incredible character, OK? He's got this book full of, uh, he has two houses in the borough by this time. One of them devoted to Ernie and his mother and, and the Irish history. You can't even walk in this place. It's full of, of all kinds of stuff. And he's upset when I pick one up that I might hurt it or something. And I start getting excited about his father because of my grandfather and because, frankly, I turned down a military career to go to law school and I always felt guilty about it. So I could honor my grandfather and I could talk about a man who was never afraid to die for his country. Okay, now, so let's go to Ernie. Ernie's born in Castle Bar, uh, Mayo in the west of Ireland in 1897. His father, Luke, is a conservative Irishman who works basically for the British government system that controls Ireland. And his mother, Marion, was from a family with more land. They moved to Dublin when he's only nine years old, and then a momentous thing happens. He's sent to the Christian Brothers School in Dublin and that school is full of teachers who are rabid nationalists. And they teach the boys that Ireland was taken over by Great Britain 300 years ago, 400 years ago before Cromwell. And the Brits took away the Irish people's right 
to their religion, to their language, to their land, and to govern themselves. So, when the rising occurs, Bernie is, let me see, seven here, maybe 18, he's a medical student, he crawls out the back window, and I've seen what, there's a sort of a shed that he, he climbed down, he gets a rifle and he starts firing on the British. So that begins his activity as a Republican. The word Republican in Ireland means anyone willing to fight for freedom. Somebody who isn't going to wait for the constitutional gradual home rule that may occur. So, I'm told I'm not supposed to read, but every once in a while I have to look down here. Ah, so Bernie becomes an organizer. Now we're going to go to this first slide. Ah, uh, there we are. And you'll see as a lad of 19 or 20, Ernie is going to the black parts of Ireland. And what he's doing is he's trying to organize the men and boys in the north, the west, and the south. You see that darkness in the south. That's the core of the IRA. Trying to organize them so they can attack British barracks and they can attack <coughs> the Royal Irish Constables who have arms. The IRA has no arms at all. Nobody's shipping arms in. Well, they tried to and it didn't work. So they have to attack these barracks, overcome them somehow. They have no organization as military men. And he's training them. And he's never had formal military training. He's reading British manuals. And he goes to these country places to do this at night. All these lads that he trains are working during the day. Is he welcome? Anybody think he was welcome? No. The parents thought, here's this college boy from Dublin. It was obvious he was an intellectual from the beginning. What the hell is he doing coming to our area to train our sons in a feudal war where they're going to be killed? So he would end up sleeping on the kitchen floor of some place in the country, washing with a few ounces of water. His revolver didn't work all the time. He was riding a decrepit bike, and he was an organizer all over Ireland. And why did he do this? Did he do it to show his older brother Frank, who was a British officer, that he could be a military man? Did he do it because he wanted to prove he was a man? He was afraid he wasn't? Did he do it to get promoted? No. He did it for none of those reasons. He did it because he was committed to the cause that Ireland should be free. And nothing would stop him in that. So, in the War of Independence in 1919, his role changes, and he becomes an organizer. From being an organizer, he becomes a combat commander. And almost immediately, he becomes a successful combat commander. And Cormac here, who really started honoring his father 50 years ago, in 1970 goes to Ireland and interviews some of the key people who worked with Ernie as young men fighters. And the first one is Sean Lamas. So we're going to find later that Sean Lamas becomes the Prime Minister of Ireland, etc. And so Sean tells Ernie, or tells Cormac, what made his father so distinct. He said, Ernie had daring characteristics. His gap between decision and action was very small. Leading men in combat, he was excellent. He would get them to do things they would never do themselves, the essence of combat command. He also had exceptional organizational ability. He wrote detailed commands to every soldier and every entity, maybe 10 to 20 a day. OK, here are two examples of what he did as a combat commander. <clears throat> Down in the south in Munster was the Mallow Barracks. There was a famous British regiment. This is seven or eight hundred men, okay? So, and these guys are training out in the countryside, and when they're training, he goes to the front door of the, the barracks and says, I've got a letter for the commanding officer. He would dress up in a little jacket when he did that. 
And the guy at the gate looked at the letter, and he grabbed his rifle, pointed it at him. His men came from around the corner, and with no casualty, they stole all of the ammunition and the arms of that British regiment. A little before that, he'd been out in the countryside with Jerry Kiley. Now, he carried a Winchester automatic rifle. Kiley had a, a, an automatic Luger. And they, and they were at the edge of the woods. And they look up, and there's a squad of British soldiers sent to kill him. He was way high on the list of people the Brits wanted. Instead of going into the woods like any normal man would, he and Kylie, he leads Kylie up the hill firing, kills a couple of the British guys, and they all disperse. Okay, so he's a warrior. Now, at 23, and this is towards the end of the War of Independence, it's about February of 1921, and the War of Independence ends in July. Mulcahy and Collins in Dublin give him the command to be general for the Second Southern Division, 7,000 men, the second largest unit of the IRA at that time. <clears throat> now, he's down in Munster. Again, he's a Dublin boy uh, at this point. He's not as well known as a number of other commanders, Dan Green, Haggerty, others, Tom Barry. Why is he picked? He's picked because, and this happens in large organizations, he's shown such unusual characteristics of organization, military leadership, drive, intelligence, that they pick him and put him in this job. Okay, so then he thinks, a few months later, that he and Lynch have the largest divisions, as I said, in the South. That's where the concentration from the background of the Fenians, the most opposition to England is, and all of a sudden he gets a truce notice from Mulcahy and Collins on July 7, 1921, and he says, what in the world are we going to get truce for when Liam and I can beat the Brits down here in Southern Ireland? Now, Mulcahy and Collins knew something that Lynch and O'Malley, the young guy, our generals, didn't know. They knew that they could not beat the Brits out of Ireland. They knew that the Brits could mobilize more forces because the First World War was over. And they knew, even more importantly, these senior guys in Dublin, they knew that it, Britain could not give total freedom to Ireland at that time because of its colonies. The Indians were agitating for freedom, and India was much more important as a colony. So what happened was, after the truce, there was six months, and then there was a treaty, and what Collins got for the, the pro-treaty side was that the Brits were going to take the 60,000 troops out of Ireland, and they were going to give lots of other freedom. They were going to ask, however, that the Irish Parliament continue to swear allegiance to the British crown. Unacceptable to Ernie and uh, Lynch, who had sworn an oath for complete freedom. And so Ernie and Lynch and De Valera, the senior government person, opposed the treaty. The treaty was voted in 67, uh, 64 to 57. And furthermore, the Irish people, 80% of them, wanted the war to end. So now we have, at the very beginning of the Civil War, a group of the IRA young hotheads had captured the four courts. If you've been to Dublin, it's the entire court system and all the government papers in the middle of Dublin. And so this was outrageous to the new Irish state, which had been formed the people who agreed with the treaty, they created an army, they had a whole government system, and the British said, what in the world do you allow these young men in the middle of Dublin to hold out against you? So the British gave all their arms and tanks, and the Free State attacked and the IRA people, and the Civil War started on June 30, 1922. Okay, now we're in the third of these three conflicts. This is the most complex one. Because Irishmen, who together were fighting Great Britain before, now split up 
into the majority of the Irish country, including the church, very important in Ireland, the business community, the Free State had an organized army, they controlled all the transportation, the people were on their side, and the IRA still said, we are not going along with the treaty, and now the same guys who were fighting together against Britain so heroically are fighting each other. It's a terrible tragedy. Now, from June 30 to August 31, only two months, here's what the Free State was able to do. They came down, and now I've got to get you the... Okay, so this looks like the, uh, the, you know, once you have to use these damn reading glasses, it's a nuisance. I hate it. So it looks like, you, you look at this and you see all the dark territory, and then you see the little uh, light thing with stripes, a little light thing with stripes with the free state. It looks like most of Ireland is against the free state. No. Okay? That's a very misleading map. This is where the IRA had some forces. In the north, they couldn't put 100 men together to form a, 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 a company. I mean, it was hopeless. So what happened was, the free state in the south, where, where the stronghold was, what is it, numbers 20, 1S and 2, or 1S, first southern division and second southern, okay, in the south. So in two months, here's what the free state army manages to do. They basically take all of that territory in the south. They take <coughs> Limerick City. They take the Kilmarnock Triangle north of Cork. They take Cork City. They take most of the ports. So in two months, in two short months, the basic stronghold of the IRA in the south is, is, is over. They're, they're in the field again, the guerrillas. But the great difference is they're guerrillas without the support of the people, okay? So at that point, the Irish College in Rome sends a very senior representative to find Lynch for O'Malley. Lynch and O'Malley controlled 70% of the active troops. If they had agreed to end the Civil War, it could have ended, in my opinion. But they don't, because first of all, their people are being treated very badly by the Free State, just the way the British treated them badly. And secondly, uh, they're hotheads, they're young guys who are great patriots, and they don't basically understand that the war is over. Now, if peace had happened in September, there are a whole group of very serious Irish IRA leaders very heroic guys who were all killed by the, executed by the Free State. The war between the two Irish factions became as savage or more savage than the war between the Irish and the British. So listen, to the, these are the key IRA leaders. They were all in the four courts. Ernie escaped, but they didn't. So. Erskine Childers, Rory O'Connor, Liam Mellows, Joe McClevey, Dick Barrett were all executed in November. Um, and about 71 other people, IRA leaders, died in prison. And even when you go to Dublin or Ireland today, there are pro-treaty people and anti-treaty people. It's a little bit like our Civil War. Now this doesn't denigrate the great contribution that Ernie and Lynch gave to, to the Irish freedom exercise because they showed the Irish in the War of Independence that even though they were scattered in the countryside, they could make a serious enough inroad against the British rulers so that they actually wanted the truce. So that truce came about because of the effective IRA resistance in, from 1919 to 1921, but then we have the tragic Civil War. Okay, so in November, a couple months after September when I said they should have, should have had a peace situation happen, Ernie is in a 
large house in a Dublin suburb. He's trying to lead the men in the north. He can't even communicate with them. He's all by himself. The Free State discovers he's in this house. They send <clears throat> about 50 men armed with high-powered rifles. They surround the house. They start firing on the house. And Ernie takes two weapons, one in each hand, and runs out shouting, no surrender here. He can't even see the men behind the stone walls. He shot nine times in the body. Imagine receiving nine rifle shots in your body, most of them in the back. He's taken to prison. He's in prison for two and a half years. Finally, the Civil War ends in May 1923. So it begins at the four courts in June. It doesn't even last a full year, it lasts 11 months. But they keep Ernie in jail 14 months after the war ended because if they let him out, he had the capacity to rise people again. I would say the rising. He was such a charismatic character. So he gets out of prison in July 1924. He has no prospects. He has no money. He goes to his family house and his father, Luke, who's very conservative, doesn't welcome him. Most of his comrades have emigrated to America. I'm not sure all of you know that after the Civil War, a lot of the Irish who came, came because they were IRA people and they weren't wanted in their own country. And most young men in that circumstance, he's 27 at the time, would have said, I can't go on having an active, meaningful life anymore. I'm just going to settle for anything. Not Ernie O'Malley. He had the same drive and the same will to survive. And now we see him become a general again in two amusing interludes. The first one is he, sent, he, he, he goes to Europe. And in Europe, he's trying to regain his health. He sees the painters he loves so much in, in Italy. He goes to Barcelona. He remarks on what the Spanish are like. And then he comes back to Paris. And one of my favorite characters in the book is Colonel Lacasse. Colonel Lacasse is a Frenchman. He's head of the Surite, the intelligence unit of the French army. And in Paris at the time is Sean McBride, who was with Ernie in the four courts. They know each other well. So Lagasse comes to Sean McBride and said, what is your friend O'Malley doing here in Paris? And Sean McBride said, I don't know. And Lagasse said, my dear fellow, you don't know what he's doing, but we know what he's doing. General O'Malley is the military advisor to that lunatic Colonel Machia, who's head of the Catalan separate group, separatist group in Paris, and Colonel O'Malley, had, or General O'Malley, has advised Colonel Machia to take his group down and invade Spain next Saturday morning. Would you please tell your friend O'Malley to dissuade them of this ridiculous expedition? He doesn't. They go down to French, pick him up, and come back. So, at this point, General O'Malley is still General O'Malley, right? And then he goes back to Ireland, and again, in a way, he's General O'Malley, because De Valera decides that he's going to send to America his two most well-known generals from the IRA, Ernie and Frank Aiken, and they're going to raise money for the Irish press. So in 1928, and here's an epiphany, we're going to discover that this man is rescued or lifted from ignominy from time to time by these events which happen. <coughs> De Valera sends him. They spend a year and they, they meet their goal and they raise their money. And there he's out on the West Coast. And what is he doing? He's getting to know all the leading creative people in Italy and in America. And now, a lot of people say, well, it was easy for him because as a young man, as a general, was so outlandish that that would get him purchased with all these people. That's not what made the difference. Because when he meets a, a <coughs> John Ford in 
Why didn't it happen? Is it? Yeah, John, well, thank you. Here's my coach. You know, when I meet John, when he meets John Ford in California, the great film director, and, and others, they gave him advice to go to Mexico, okay? And he, again, here's another theme in his life. Older women who sort of take him in and protect him and help him. Isn't it odd that the firebrand uh, young general killer is taken in by all these ladies who watch over him and worry him? And so Helen Golden and he, another older lady whose wife had been a famous Irish Shakespearean actor, Helen Golden, drive him down to Taos, where there's an intellectual community, and he gets to know them, okay? There he is in the Pyrenees when he was in Italy. Okay, so he goes down to Taos, and here is Mabel Dodge Lujan, who has a colony of intellectuals, and who do they include? D.H. Lawrence, Georgia O'Keeffe, Ellie Young, the Irish poet, and these people stimulate him some way to get to know a woman named Dorothy Stewart, who's another muse. She has a car, and they go down to Mexico. And in Mexico, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Coach. When he's in Taos, I missed this one, uh, he gets to know the Navajo Indians and all these people. And when later on, this is important, I'm going to tell you in a minute why this, his exposure to the Indians is interesting. Okay, then he gets to Mexico with the Dorothy Stewart. Two of the leading American writers at, at the time are Hart Crane, who wrote The Brooklyn Bridge, and Catherine Ann Porter, Ship of Fools. And they take him in their apartment, and he lives there with them. And now we see why he was able to connect with these creative, leading intellectuals. This is Hart Crane talking about it. <clears throat> I have my most pleasant literary moments with an Irish revolutionary, the most quiet and appreciative person I've ever met, Ernest O'Malley by name. All of a sudden, Hart Crane and Ernie O'Malley are best friends. He meets um, Sergei Eisenstein, the greatest film director from Russia of the time. He studies Diego Rivera and Jose Clemente Orozoco, the great muralist, and he's smart enough to realize that Orozoco is a greater painter. But at the same time, even though he's shy, when he was in America, he made a profound impression on the public as well. Now listen to this report of a, of a New York newspaper about Ernie O'Malley's fundraising. Quote, this was one of the most fashionable social Irish events ever held in New York City. It was joined by all the most prominent Irishmen. The Grand March was led by Ernie O'Malley, the Irish Republican leader. When he entered the hall, the, bank, the band played the soldier's song, and all the audience joined the singer. Okay, <clears throat> he's down in Taos, he's back there again, and he decides to go to New York. And all his life, these people he meet pass him on to others. And so <clears throat> Paul Strand, the photographer, knows the people at Yadu. You've all heard about that. It's the intellectual community north of New York City. And he goes there and he's invited as a special fellow to write his book. Now, listen to the other Americans who went to Yadu. Truman Capote, Leonard Bernstein, James Baldwin. So he's among the elite. They came later, but all those same people same status of people are there all the way through the time. And he's in New York City. The only trouble is he doesn't have a job. He doesn't have any money. He doesn't even have enough to eat. So what he says is, last year being so hard, I organized New York so I was invited out to dinners about four nights a week. <laughs> but I get so bored with the society that I found it was better to be hungry. <laughs> okay, now we have 
two life-changing events again. You think his courage gave God the idea that he was going to rescue him all the time? I mean, I can't believe how these things kept happening. Or was he so extraordinary that people reached out to him? What happens, number one, is that De Valera, who now more or less controls the country, 10 years after the treaty and truce, meaning that okay, he and all the people that supported the treaty were correct. Um, number one, De Valera gives him a military pension and disability, which gives him enough money so he can come back to Ireland and live, and even propose marriage. Number two is more dramatic for him, in my opinion, there we go. <clears throat> Elon and Blanche Hooker in their Greenwich mansion have a lot of money, have four dollars. They have this system of people in New York City that they use to invite the most eligible and interesting young men to meet the daughters. Were they successful? You bet they were. The youngest girl had just married the most eligible bachelor in America John D. Rockefeller III. But the older sister, Helen, she's 28 years old. She's fiercely independent. She's traveled in Europe. She's a sculptor already. And at 28, she knows more about men than Ernie, Ernie at 36 will ever know. I don't want to comment on Europe. <laughs> get them mixed up sometimes. It's hard. I'm looking down at him. He's an Irishman, obviously. And so, Ernie and Elon, the father, and now we go back to that slide about the Indians, the Navajos. Elon asks him about the American Indian in the Southwest, and Ernie protests that the government is doing a terrible, awful job on taking advantage of the Indians, and Elon Hooker gets so angry, he says, you'll never come to this house again. He was wrong on that one. <laughs> what do you think Helen, the fierce daughter, said? This is the first time one of my bows could ever stand up to my father. Now, the romance begins, but don't think Ernie was the effective suitor again, because he's awkward as ever, the great combat leader had no idea how to deal with, with women. And for the first year of their courtship, the letters begin, <clears throat> Dear Helen Hooker, and they're signed, Sincerely Yours. And then, all of a sudden, Cupid comes down to earth, and the letters go, <clears throat> Dear Pussycat, <laughs> I feel warm inside when I think of you. That's all the news except to say that I love you. Is that news? God bless him. <laughs> they get married. Now, before going further, these two strong individualistic people had no idea of the character and personality differences they had that would make their marriage very challenging. <clears throat> They become part of Dublin's intellectual life. Ernie finally gets On Another Man's Wound published. <clears throat> and this is what the New York Times said. A beautiful, stirring book, the Herald Tribune, a tale of heroic adventure told without rank or, or rhetoric. However, the first of many events which challenge their marriage occur when now, a lawyer in Northern Ireland brings a libel suit against Ernie, claiming that in the War of Independence, or the, the, the War of Independence book on another man's wound, he was libel when Ernie said he was a coward and wouldn't go out and fight. He wins the suit. Ernie should have realized that if you, the libel laws of Britain and Ireland are much more fierce than ours. And in order to win the lawsuit, Ernie had to get witnesses who knew the barrister from Donegal. This happened 20 years ago. Do you think any of the barrister's friends and supporters are going to come? No, he wins the lawsuit. 
Helen is upset because there's a lot of publicity. Ernie has to borrow to pay it. It's twice the amount of his yearly compensation from the government. Elon Hooker agrees to pay it, but Ernie refuses. So here you see this pride. Helen is surprised when their first child, Cathal, the older brother of Cormac, is born, uh, and she goes to Dublin to have the child. And now we have more tension because the Cathal is born only uh, nine and a half months after the marriage, and by the time he's about six months old, Helen begins traveling. She's also obviously a very restless person. She goes to London, and she goes to New York and Greenwich, and she's away for three months. And listen to the plaintive, those damn glasses again. I don't know why I've got them here. I wish I could touch a button and the eyes would change. Um, OK. So here is Ernie writing his dear wife after, let me see, about 17 months of marriage. <coughs> I played with the baby, and he's doing well. The house is lonely without you. I don't know when you'll be back. Not when you say, I think. Then they decide to buy a house in County Mayo, where, he, where Ernie's people are from. And they say there in <coughs> County Mayo, if you throw a rock, you're hitting O'Malley. And this is a wonderful house. It's out on the sea. It has docks on both sides, and they begin farming. At first, it's kind of a romantic, interesting thing, and they like it, and then it gets difficult. Ernie breaks his leg, the, the neighboring Walsh brothers, who resent this couple from Dublin with money who have bought land, begin to threaten Helen, and it gets so unpleasant for them. In addition, two basic issues of the character differences come up. Number one, Helen, even though she has much more money than Ernie, uh, is a relative spendthrift and she begins to borrow from friends. Really upsetting him. He was brought up in a family where every penny is counted. The second marital issue, anybody know what's more serious than money? I'll tell you. Ernie gets his own room because he likes to read late at night. <clears throat> And Helen is very proud of her sexuality. And she's a strong, wonderful woman. And she comes to him in the night to make up. And what does Ernie do? He says, until we resolve our intellectual differences, that's not going to happen. <laughs> what a disaster. <laughs> okay? So then, um, <clears throat> then they go back to Dublin in the following way. Helen really misses her intellectual friends. And remember, she's an artist as distinguished in many ways as Ernie is more, perhaps. And she misses all the people in Dublin. And she buys a house in a wonderful Dublin suburb and wants uh, Cormac and the children to come back. And they do eventually. And there they are back in Dublin. What do you think happens? Two doors away in the suburb is Liam Redman, a handsome, dashing actor. And Liam has a family the same uh, ages and they get together. <clears throat> and Helen is so interested in a project that Liam and his fellow actors are doing in Dublin. They're forming a new theater, both in London and in Dublin. She invests a thousand pounds which is double his annual stipend, <clears throat> and begins seeing a lot of them, and <clears throat> Ernie gets jealous, OK? So then we go on. And Ernie, however, is back in Dublin. And now we see another facet of his life. He's become not only a meaningful writer, but he's one of the, oh, wait, we saw you wonder why poor Ernie fell in love? Just look at this lady, OK? And here is Ernie in, in Dublin now, back living in the Dublin suburb <clears throat> with Jack Yates, who is the leading modern Irish painter, the brother of W.B. Yates. 
And here is the, the family with the three children. <clears throat> but going back to Ernie in Dublin, he began, becomes a really leading sponsor of Irish art. <clears throat> he sponsors and organizes Yates' 1945 National Exhibitions in Dublin and London. <clears throat> he wrote an Evie Horn, a stained glass artist, a woman who become his daughter's godmother, and quote, she is the best stained glass worker in Europe. Her importance will increase with time. He supports Louis de Brokey, who's one of the leading Irish painters who paints the gypsies in Connemara of Western Ireland. <clears throat> he, he's appointed books editor of The Bell, the leading intellectual Dublin magazine. He makes broadcasts on Oriental, Arabic, and African music for Irish radio. The warrior has genuinely become a world intellectual. The marriage continues to deteriorate. The couple lives apart. They don't even see each other at Christmas. <clears throat> and now Helen writes to Ernie, and this is another message that often, <clears throat> when marriages go apart, equal guilt or equal responsibility lies with each party. Helen is writing to Ernie, trying to get her reconciled. She says, perhaps you need to be alone the rest of your life, but I have already had to spend much of my life with you alone and without companionship of heart or act. Ernie takes the three children from the Dublin house back to Borishul. Now at this time, under Irish law, a woman could not take her own children out of the country without permission of the father, written permission. So Helen is back in Greenwich and Park Avenue, and Ernie is with the three children in Borishul. And Ernie sends the two older children, Katha and Eitan, the boy and the girl, to the Ring College, a boarding school in Waterford in Southern Ireland, where they only speak Irish. He's trying to help these children become closer to the Irish culture. <clears throat> Helen, unbeknownst to Ernie, goes to Dublin, sees the Redmond family, and Mrs. Redmond supported this, this activity that they were going to do, and she and Liam rent a car in Dublin. They drive down to Waterford in the south, and they go to the boarding school. And Ernie has told the headmaster, don't let these children out of your sight. He has some instinctual fear something might happen. Indeed it does, because they take the children to a local inn for lunch, and the headmaster comes with them dutifully. When he goes to the bathroom, they rush the children to the car, they drive to Belfast. Her father has arranged a private plane that flies them to the French coast. And even though Ernie alerts the French authorities, it doesn't help because Liam and Helen are clever enough to take a train from the French coast to Marseille and then, she, and then he stays there and goes back to Dublin. She takes the children by various routes back to New York. When she gets there, the reporters, this is a famous couple by now, the reporters are all over the Park Avenue apartment in front. She takes them in by the back door. Okay, now, there they are. You see the three, wouldn't it be wonderful if everything had worked out? Okay. Now, Ernie and his father, Ernie is, uh, or, or Ernie and Cormac, Cormac, he's a cute little fellow, isn't he? He's seven, <laughs> seven or eight years old, and, oh, I missed something that we've got to talk about, and, and, and that is that uh, Ernie and his father, go on the set of The Quiet Man, the John Ford. Have I ever covered that? No, I didn't, no. Ernie and Cormac, now, isn't it wonderful I've got a person here correcting me. Ernie and Cormac, Ernie at the time was about 50, 52 or something, and Cormac is seven. And he gets a message from John Ford. He has another lifting event in his life 
He just lost his two children. He's desolate. He doesn't have much money. He's living in a little part of the house. He's with Cormac. And John Ford contacts him and says, I want you to help me make a film, The Quiet Man in Ireland, with Maureen O'Hara and uh, John Wayne. And there they are. Okay? So Ernie and Cormac are living in Borishul, and I've seen this room. It's a small room. There's a peat fire. They only have two meals a day. There's not much money. It's really a tough situation. And Helen, at that point, brings a lawsuit against Ernie to take the house back away. And this is a, a situation where legally the title of the house was with Helen, but this is what the Irish do to protect their culture and this wonderful fellow sitting in front of me. When she brings the suit, the Chief Justice in Dublin writes a draft opinion as follows, quote, <clears throat> Plaintiff Helen, in breach of her duty as the wife of this defendant, wrongfully deserted the defendant and moved the two older children out of the court's jurisdiction. It is an ancient maxim that a suitor coming into a court of equity must come with clean hands. So they keep their place at Borishu, and then later they go to Dublin. <clears throat> now, we all like redemption. We like some feeling of grace in a difficult situation. And here is one. There's a redemptive moment in the marriage of these extraordinary people. In 1973, remember Ernie dies in 1957, almost 20 years later, <clears throat> Helen comes to Ireland. She's interviewed by the national radio. And the reporter says, Helen, why, after all your difficulties together, did you ask Ernie to marry you again in 1953? You had divorced him. You were with another man. You were married. Why did you ever do that? And Helen said, simply, you don't understand, she said. There was nobody like him. I would have done it all over again. Now, we're at the end of Ernie's life. And Ernie died in 1957 at the age of 60 of heart conditions and many things. And he wanted a simple funeral. Uh, however, who do we have again as old comrades? Is, is D. Blair in the middle, John Lamas, and Frank Aiken. These other two were fighters with him in the countryside, right? And they insist that he gets a state funeral. Now, at a state funeral, <clears throat> here's a state funeral. At a state funeral, the <clears throat> 300 servicemen come, and the, the coffin is, is taken through the streets, and Ernie's coffin had the battered flag from the four courts over it. And Dan Green, one of the toughest guys in the IRA, a comrade of Ernie, came all the way from Tipperary for the funeral. No one had ever seen Dan Green weep before. Thank you very much. We love to have some questions. Well, my, my 
as Harry said, my parents were fairly busy, and they had provided sort of staff, and which was quite common in Irish and many other households, where uh, for not too much money you could get you know, your uh, uh, staff to take care of uh, not only uh, the cooking but the nanny part of life. Um, and uh, so they were off and about, and um, I really rarely saw them before 1950. Um, they must have been around doing their uh, <laughs> the various activities, uh, founding theaters and being at sculptors and uh, at exhibits. But uh, the family life was uh, relatively, uh, we were on the staff end of things. So um, I did get to know me and my brother and sister. I have sort of vague memories of them. Um, but in fact, what happened was after they departed, I got uh, to have a better and closer relationship with my father because there was no staff. So there was the only two of us taking uh, the normal things off uh, what you do in the day and when you cook and, and how do you go about the, the routines of life. So um, it, it wasn't, it, it was quite a surprise when I came back to America and met my brother and sister again. It was seven years later. And um, of course, uh, I didn't know what the great expectations were, but the minute we hit the ground in New York, they went back to school. So <laughs> all the great aspirations of having, uh, you know, a loving, uh, we've, um, in fact, as a family, we've never talked about until this past year about uh, what of us, uh, each of us felt about the occasion. And I think they're both in, in the movie, um, uh, a call to arts, which is currently on uh, Connecticut Public Television. And my sister and brother came out, and, and they'd never spoken to me, but they spoke to the camera. Uh, Chris Keppel did a, an excellent job in capturing them and getting them to talk about uh, what that loss of the father, what the loss of Ireland uh, meant to, to each of them. And, and uh, so, uh, yes, thank you for the question. Derek, my son. Uh, so I, I know that you recently came back from a tour in Ireland for the book. Any, any um, insights or, or surprises in terms of how the book was received? Well, there's an irresistible story there that <clears throat> Cormac and I differ on a little bit. It, it shows the difference between Irish culture and American culture. And we're in Castle Bar, and we don't know that the former prime minister is asked by the publisher to give the story of our book. So we have 110 people there at night, and Cormac and I are up on the stage. And the former prime minister was a very smooth article indeed, and used to be a teacher, starts giving the story from our book. And he gets to chapter three after 15 minutes, and I can see he's going to read, he's going to do what I tried to do. And I think, that's not fair. So I, not knowing and being an outrageous American, I raise my hand, look at the crowd, and say, everyone, this other old guy and I came 4,000 miles to tell our story, and here the prime minister is doing it for us. What can we do? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> the prime minister sits down. And afterwards, a, a strong lady newspaper reporter said, you know, that crowd could have gone either way. <laughs> they could have either lynched you or what have you. And I desperately grabbed the mic and worked the crowd for half an hour and saved the day. But it was awkward because I didn't understand the protocol and acted um, passionately, as Cormac might say. <laughs> and so that was one incident we had. <laughs> Well, we had a second event in Dublin, uh, and it went far more smoothly. Uh, and, and indeed, practice in Ireland, uh, unbeknownst to me, is that the person who is asked to launch the book does actually the state work, uh, reads the book thoroughly, and makes their own analysis of it. And the author is uh, only supposed to say thank you, and uh, you know, for, for the next occasion. Yes, we have a question. Why didn't you go with your mother? Uh, good question. Uh, why, uh, why did my mother only kidnap two? 
Well, uh, my <laughs> or three. Uh, my two, my brother and sister were in a school, and I was not in that school. So I was at home uh, with my father, and she dared not go into that home. Um, and so um, she took the easy, uh, uh, easy way out and took two out of three. <laughs> Yes, sir. All right. Did you, in in your and you heard, did you see some foreshadow during Ernie's military career of the turn to artistic pursuits that he later took? I know he did a lot of writing, but it sounded to me like military writing. No, no, or writing to. Uh, uh, you know. his, his artistic uh, instincts and, and passions were evident in that period, the warring period. For example, he's in the Four Courts, which is being shelled. Remember, they, they, the IRA took the Four Courts in the middle of Dublin. He goes back to his room and he says, oh my, look, here's the Vasari's lives of the, the Italian painters. There's a bullet hole through it. Here is Montaigne's essays. Wouldn't it be nice to have him here? A piece of shell hit it. And, and here's Baudelaire. And so you see early on, he's viewing these paint durer. I mean, he had a deep uh, interest in painting and in literature. His reading was varied. So he was an, in one of these early, quiet intellectuals who had enormous curiosity, and we can weave that into the first half of the book, and happily somebody's going to do a film on that in Ireland, and he's going to pull back into the warring period the early intellectual drive which enabled him to become such a good author and the rest of it. Yes, ma'am. If you kind of research your question a little, what are you saying? Did he ever accept that, that the six counties was not part of Ireland? Um, but no, he never. He never accepted that. But, but, but a, a sub part of that would be what did he do about that? Uh, you know, rec reconciliation. He, he didn't take up arms again. Uh, basically, after uh, 1924, he never really took up arms again. When he got out of jail, however, he was still on the Army Council. Um, um, the political party uh, from Sinn Féin, which had been the Nationalist Party, uh, he always remained the Sinn Féiner, which would have been, even until today, is 32 counties and no oaths to the, to the, the king. Um, de Valera uh, split away from uh, that uh, Sinn Féin campaign in 1927 and said, look, the reality of life is there is a division in the country, there are 26 counties versus six, um, and that uh, if we just take a false oath, and here's that they are taking another oath, which the Xi Jinping wouldn't dare do, and we'll, we'll get in, we can, with that oath, we can sit in the parliament and participate in the parliament. Republicans, even to this day in Northern Ireland, will not sit in the British Parliament even though the, they are elected. And Ernie O'Malley was elected to uh, the Free State Parliament but would not sit. So in, even as late as 1928 when he decided not to rerun uh, for, for Parliament, uh, I would say he was still a Sinn Féinor and even in 1929 when he was in America he was a Sinn Féinor. Uh, we, it, it becomes uh, murky later as, because he doesn't write about the politics, um, but he, we know he doesn't take up arms. So he sort of is, de, accepts the de facto reality. And what happens under the de Valera regime is it becomes more and more politically correct and acceptable to the Republicans. The de Valera puts in a new constitution in 1937 and very cleverly says, 
the island, the geographic uh, state is defined by the island of Ireland. That's all it says. Republicans can say, yay, you know, our government recognizes that this is 32 counties on a mission. So, I don't know much more than that. Yes, sir. Do you think, um, as, as you described your life, I was wondering, was there really a gap in mentorship for him? Or was he in such an orbit on his own that, I mean, it seems like out of Ireland, there, were, there seemed to be people coming to him. Um, there are always, always mentors and supporters. And I don't think I read the passage where he, to Molly Childers, where he says he's in jail, and he says, I look at you as my true mother, and I hope God understands that I was right in my hunger strike. And all the way through to the end of this, he had, for example, former comrades in, in Dublin, when he was suffering from illness and didn't have any place to live, would invite him to their house and give him the marital bed and they would sleep on the couch. And other people would uh, pay for his hospital. And he always had this incredible loyalty from people. And when I was in Dublin with Cormac three or four years ago, Cormac gave a talk at City Hall and there was this picture of his father up on all Gold Coast, Ernie O'Malley. And we come out of our place and we get in the taxi and an older taxi driver looks around and he said, you wouldn't be the son of Ernie O'Malley, would you? <laughs> and and Cormac said yes and he said, you won't pay a fare in my taxi in Dublin City. <laughs> so that his father still has, and all the way through there were the older women, there were Count Plunkett, uh, all these people would take him in he always had enormous recognition as to his individuality and his unique character, and that recognition translated itself practically into many people who supported him in all kinds of ways. Yes, he must have been one hell of a character. Yes, sir. One question I have. Most of the honorary leaders were arrested, quite a few of them. What happened to De Valera that he never got arrested? He was the head of the United States. You're talking about the Civil War? Yes. Yes, De Valera was arrested about August 25th in the, uh, and was put into Kilmena. No one ever knew where, where he was. They knew that he had been uh, arrested. Um, but it was just prior to the elections in which he was re-elected and my father was elected. Um, he was put in Kilmainham um, uh, to be kept out of the way, um, and he didn't get out of there till uh, mid-1924. And so um, uh, he, was, he was out before father, but the whole idea was to hide him uh, so that it, neither he nor any of the other Republican leaders could become a, a crusader uh, against the free state. So he, he was captured. Nick. Yes, um, as, as the son of uh, Gary Martin, I have a question. Um, so this, this passion of writing has been in your blood for a long time. And I know Cormac, you've done an incredible series of publishing in your career. Uh, what would you say to the younger people about um, what it takes to be published? Especially oh, <laughs> okay. Thank God I didn't have to make a living from this. Um, Ernie's book on another man's wound, and one of the amusing things that Cormac would say, why do you quote my father so much in the book? I quote your father so much because he wrote about ten times better than I did, that's why. Yeah. Ernie's book was submitted to 14 publishing houses, and so was our book submitted Oxford University, oh, oh, somebody here, oh, don't worry, the editor, yes. Yeah, okay. oh, we're very interested, it looks like a good subject. On all over the place, we, we put this book over a period of a year and a half or two years. Writing a book is difficult. First of all, the first time you write a book, you think you can write and you can't. I mean, a number of people here, uh, David, Stewart, and others, helped me 
learn how to write. I, I wrote annual reports. I thought I was a writer. I wasn't. So first of all, it's very hard to write it. Getting it published is five times as hard. And now, getting something published is almost impossible unless you have some link. So if you want to be a writer, don't try to earn a living from it, number one. Do it on the side, and it's difficult to do on the side because it's so absorbing. Um, I wouldn't advise anybody particularly to be a writer. <laughs> Bruce, the greatest, I think, novelist of the 20th century, couldn't get his book published, he self-published, and then Andre G. afterwards wrote, Mon cher Proust, it was the greatest mistake I ever made not to publish you. Sure, hell of good that is, if you killed yourself, published yourself, and then somebody says, I missed it. Anyway, don't try to write it. <laughs> Oh, by the way, my dear wife reminds both of us that we're a partnership here. There are a lot of wonderful books up here. We hope you, you are so intrigued by this this evening that you can't wait to come up. We autographed every one of them. Right, Carmack?